Okay, it's very special that we have with us <coughs> Dr. Strauss, um, <coughs> Dr. Avram Strauss. I want to tell you how we met Dr. Strauss and I. We met about, um, give or take, 20, yeah, 25, about 25 years ago. So I was learning in <coughs> Coil in Melbourne, Australia. In, we went off and got married in Melbourne. Yeah. And um, we had a, one baby was born in Melbourne, Australia. So she's a Melbourneite. <coughs> yep. And one day we were sitting in the coil and in walks a guy. And he comes in and he tells us um, that he wants to learn Taira. So, no problem. We were there to learn it. To learn it to you, no problem. But he wanted to learn full time. He said he wants to join the coil. Now, he didn't look the type at all. He looked, <laughs> you know, he wasn't from, and, but he wants to join the coil. So, um, yeah, the truth is, I thought for sure he, something's wrong. Probably not normal. And so, um, yeah, but like, good luck, good luck. But he was smart. He learned exactly how you get Lubavitches. You know how you get them? He went down the road, down um, Balaclava Road, the other way. What's it called down the other way? Carlisle. Carlisle Street, right? <laughs> he went down there and he found another coilo. And that coil is called? Beza Talmud. So he went to Beza Talmud and he told them the same thing. Now Beza Talmud gave him a couple of shear. Beza Talmud is literature, right? So now he came back to us and he said, hey, you've got some shearim over there going on. So we're like, whoa, one second. You mean to say you were them? So now it became competition. So now, you know, we had, by the way, we had a good mashgiach in Koyal. You know who the mashgiach in Koyal was? What? That's right. His name was Rabbi Tayyar. Um, not Rabbi Tayyar, I'm sorry. Rabbi Stabach was a good mashgiach. Rabbi Tayyar, I'm sorry, I mixed it up. Rabbi Tayyar was in Koyal. He was one of the, one of the Abrahe Yes, I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, and from then on, basically, he, he, uh, he started to learn. And he learned full time. And he was like totally, he became one of the Yungalites. And for like a whole year, he was just learning together with us everything. And it was just like, it was unbelievable. And, and he became a total, you know, Kyle Yungaman. And one day, my mother called me up from South Africa. And she's asked me if I know of a Shidduch. She gave me an age, something, this kind of guy, that kind of thing, and whatever. Do I know someone for there's a girl? Okay, oh, would you like, you know? And I said to her, um, I mean, actually, I do, but there's no chance because we're in Australia and you're in South Africa, and unlike Americans think Australia and South Africa are very far from each other. And <laughs> meaning, like, from here to South Africa is the same as from South Africa to Australia, right? So it's really far. But she said, but well, who is it? So I told her. And a week later, something like that, he was on the plane to South Africa. And about a week later, in a full-fledged Shidduch style, they were engaged. And then they got married. And um, since then, we have uh, kept in touch. <coughs> Dr. Strauss got smicha. And, um, well, if I tell you everything else, then, you know. I'll leave him to There's tell plenty, you. Plenty more to tell. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he's standing or sitting? Whatever he wants. Maybe easier for me to talk about him. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Strauss, for coming to speak to us. Very appreciate it. So you can tell from my accent that I'm not Australian. I grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in a conservative house. I went to Hebrew school. And I went to shul on Rosh Hashanah in Yom Kippur. That was it. And the day I finished Hebrew school and I had a bar mitzvah, I swore I would never go back. It was the worst experience of my life. And I didn't go back for quite a long time. And I moved to Australia because I really wanted to have an adventure. And I lived on a farm there in the middle of nowhere. And I was, at that time, I was married to a different wife, and I had a son that was born there. 
And my son one day uh, was getting bullied in school. And so I went to the school and I complained about it. And they said, this in Australia, you suck it up. He's got to toughen up. And I said, see you later. Mm -hmm. I left. And I homeschooled my son for two years on that farm in the middle of Australia, in a rural area. And one day, he has a dream. And in the dream, he goes back to school. Well, I was very relieved because homeschooling is a very difficult project, if any of you have ever experienced it. So let me take one step back here. About six months before that, maybe, a rabbi showed up at the farm. It wasn't a Lubavitcher, Rabbi Davis, he was from Manchester, England. He was the local rabbi in the city near where the farm was. I don't even know to this day how he found me, but he showed up on the farm, and I, I knew uh, enough because I had been to yeshiva when I was like 18 years old for a few months. It's another, another piece of the story. So I knew enough that he wasn't going to eat my food. I think I gave him a glass of water in a plastic cup or something. And he had a son that was the same age as my son. So I used to drive my son down to the city because he said, why don't you bring your son over to uh, visit us? I'd drop him there. I would go to the beach. We were on Shabbos. I would drive him down, drop him off. He would spend the day with the rabbi. I would go to the beach or go shopping or something and then pick him up on the way home, go back to the farm. And we did this for a while. So when my son wanted to go back to school, I knew there was a Jewish school in the city. And we had tried a bunch of schools around where we lived. So I thought, you know what, I'll just see what this school is like. I took my son there. And this school, this community that, that in the city had 150 families. So the school, the only way the school was viable was fully half the kids were not Jewish that went there. They had a gifted and talented program. So people would send their kids to the Jewish school because it was a better education. They had the special program for talented kids. So in order to get admission, you had to get tested. My son goes into the room. I remember the guy's name was Mr. Southern. And he's in there. I'm sitting outside in the hallway. After 45 minutes, he comes out and calls me into the room without my son. And he says to me, your son is a genius. And I, I thought to myself, he's got the wrong kid. I just homeschooled him for two years. He's definitely no genius. He said, no, no, he's a genius. I said, what makes you think so? And he says to me, I, uh, you see how I was in here with him for 45 minutes? Yeah. He said, normally I'm finished in about 10 or 15 minutes. The kids like finish with the questions. I said, like, what kind of questions? Well, I asked him, and you have to imagine this is a 10-year-old. I asked him, how is it possible that somebody has an illness and they go to one doctor and they're told they have this condition and they go to a different doctor and they're told they have another condition? Things like that, like the interesting thought type questions. So he says to me, does your son watch television? Uh, I was very against television. I had no TV on the farm. I said, no. He said, no, he needs to watch television. I was so intrigued by this guy that I left the farm. I moved into the city so that my son could go to the school because it was too far to commute. And I started to get involved with the, with the shul there. At that time, Rabbi Davis' oldest son graduated from that school. I think the school went up to eighth grade. And he moved back to England because he didn't want his son to travel for school. He didn't want to send him away for school. And they brought in another rabbi. At that time, I was actually even on the board of the shul. So I thought, maybe we'll get a Lubavitcher. There was a Rabbi Fox in, in uh, Doncaster, right? Who's the Australian here? Is he still there? Rabbi Fox in Doncaster? I don't know. Fox in Pretoria. Yeah? Anyway, there was a Rabbi Fox in Doncaster, and he was, not, he was a Lubavitcher, but the community wasn't a Lubavitch. So I thought maybe that could work. But no, the, you'll see when you get involved with your shlichus that the person who makes the decisions in the town is not the board of the shul. It's usually a few wealthy families and, because they're the ones paying for everything. So these wealthy families said, no, we don't want a Lubavitcher. OK, fine. So they got another guy. He didn't work out. And then they did get a Lubavitcher in there. And that's how I got involved in learning Tanya, and who was Lubavitcher? What was his name? Yossi Engel. He's still Does there. Anyone know Yossi Engel? Oh, it's Emma. His father. Amazing. You see how all, uh, everything uh, comes around. So I was on the board when we hired him, your father. Yeah, exactly. 
exactly. The Adelaide Hebrew Congregation. And as far as I know, the Adelaide Hebrew Congregation still exists, although there was uh, you know, some issues in the, the school, I'm pretty sure, closed down. That school was amazing. Ronnie Figdor. Did you ever meet Ronnie Figdor when you were in Melbourne? You know who Ronnie Figdor is? He was like, he was the, the Manal. Amazing, amazing guy. So dedicated. I would drive by the school at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he, his car would be there and the light would be on. He was like just a workaholic. But he made that place happen. When he left, the school kind of spiraled down, and I'm pretty sure it closed. So I got more and more involved due to Rabbi Angle. And I decided one day I'm going to try to keep Shabbos. So somebody invited me to dinner. I had to walk across the town to get to this person's house, and I walked back home. Only one problem. I lived in a gated community, so I couldn't operate the gates because it was Shabbos. So I thought, I'll wait, and I'll just walk in behind a car when somebody else goes in. But nobody came. I'm sitting there in the middle of the night. I'm sitting there waiting, waiting. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to climb over the wall. I was so worried that the police are going to catch me climbing over the wall. But I got in, and I got in safely. And I thought to myself, I want to now keep kosher in my house. It was Pesach. And Rabbi Engel organized that some bachram from Melbourne came to my house, and they koshered my kitchen. And I remember I was talking to them about all these kind of metaphysical things. They were not at all interested in listening to me. They all, all they wanted to do was to blowtorch my kitchen and get out of there. <laughs> but I decided after that I'm going to keep the kitchen kosher and then I thought you know what if anybody in Adelaide wants to become religious they go to Melbourne there was a problem there was a problem for your mother because like you know, she has a friend and the friend becomes religious and the friend leaves like there was just nobody nobody would stay there so I found a family in Melbourne the Goldmans and they had a, at that time I was divorced I was a single guy. I thought, you know what? I'm going to retire. So I sold my practice. I retired. And I heard that there was this kolel. So Chaim Svi Groner was the, was the boss of the kolel. And uh, I wrote him a letter. There was no real internet back in that day. The, the internet was just starting back in that time. I wrote him a letter. He didn't respond to me. I tried to call him. I couldn't get through to him. I thought, you know what the heck? I'm just going to go, and I'm going to show up. So I went there, I traveled to Melbourne, I got this room in this house, I walked into the Kolel, and I met Chaim Svi Groner, and I said to him, I want to learn, I want to, I, I want to learn about Judaism. So he says to me, what's your background? So I told him that I knew basically nothing, that I had been bar mitzvah, that I spent three months in yeshiva in Israel, learning Gittin. And the only thing I remember Eidachad Neman Besurin. That's it. That's all I remember from my three months there. I remember getting off the plane at JFK and thinking to myself, I have no idea how to keep kosher. I have no idea how to keep Shabbos. I have no idea how to daven. I took my yarmulke off, and I thought, you know what? I gave that a good shot. It didn't work for me. So I explained this all to Chaim Svi Groner. And he says to me, it's all very well and good that you want to do this, but we're like graduate school, and you're like in kindergarten. Says it, you know, we, says it's, it's not something that we do. It's very noble that you want to do it, but is, this is not the place for you. He says to me, we have shirim in the evening, public shirim. You're very welcome to come. So, okay. So I noticed on the bookshelves there were some English books. I said, would you mind if I sit here and learn? He's like, it's a place open to the public. You can do that if you want. So I sat down and... One of the rabbis there came over to me. I don't think it was Rabbi Bigler, but it was one of them. Came over to me and he says to me, you know, Thursdays from 10 to 11, I have a gap in my schedule. I can learn with you. And by the end of the day, between that kolel and the Lakewood kolel across the street, I had a booked out day from 7 in the morning until 9 o'clock at night. And I stayed there for a year and I learned. And it wasn't easy because it's, you know, I don't know whether you guys understand this, but it is humiliating to, be, to put yourself into a situation where you don't speak the language, you don't know what to wear, you don't know where to go, you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say. 
And I was used to being kind of like the master of my world. And now I'm like absolutely nothing. But I did have a few things that really helped me. Number one, I found Rabbi Bigler. And he was like, he, he's a, you know, a modest guy. But he, but he was, like, even though the Frenchman, Rabbi Sabah, was the you know, so-called the head of the kolel, uh, I noticed that everybody came to Rabbi Bigler when they had their questions. So I befriended Rabbi Bigler because I thought maybe this guy knows, you know, uh, he's, he's the guy in the know. And then there was another person. His name was Herschel Goldman. And he was really like my elder chassid, even though he's younger than me. He was a, he is, it was his house that I lived in, and he really held my hand. He told me, where should I go? What should I wear? You know, like, what do you wear? What do you wear? What do you dress? How do you dress on this occasion? How do you dress on that occasion? I, I, I felt like I didn't know anything. And I stayed there, and I learned, and I learned. And it was a great experience for me. Amazing people, actually. Amazing people. And you think about all the, uh, the rabbis in, in Melbourne. They were just incredible, incredible people. And they lifted me up. And, then, and so I got married. And when I got married, Rabbi Vickler's brother, Duty, met me at the airport in Joburg. He took me under his wing. I met this, this lady that I eventually married, and I stayed in Rabbi Vigler's father's house, and Rabbi Vigler's father, again, became like the elder chassid to me. I remember him taking me to downtown Joburg to buy a kapata for the wedding. And who's, who here is from South Africa? Nobody? Nobody's here from South Africa? Well, when you go into downtown Johannesburg, it's like the deepest, darkest place that you could imagine. You have to pay somebody to look after your car. They don't have parking meters. They have like a kid who's like, that's his block. And you have to pay him. And if you don't pay him, he'll make sure your car's not there when you come back. And it's like, it was a very uh, unnerving experience. And I had to go in, I believe, two or three times for the, the fittings and everything. Yeah. 1,500 rand for a handmade, gorgeous kapata that I still have. That was like about maybe 80 bucks or something. <laughs> Amazing. I remember the, going into the tailor store, <laughs> into his shop. Peter Ressa was his name. Remember Peter Ressa? Did you ever have a, a kapata made by him? Anyway, he had a rack of suits that he was making for some African king's daughter's wedding. Like morning suits, like gray with the tails and the whole thing. It's a stunning, stunning thing. But I got married there, and I had... Seven Lubavitch rabbis at the chuppah. Like the whole organization kind of like took care of me. Rabbi Groner taught me the mimer. Rabbi Groner walked across Joburg to come to, to, to my uh, ufruf. And the wedding was amazing. Yeah, really was an incredible experience. So I came back to New York, and I lived not too far from here. I lived in Muncie, I lived in Aramont, and I raised my family there. And now I have two girls that are 19 and 21. The 21-year-old got married about a month before October 7th, yeah? September 6th, she got married. And who was Masada Kedushin? I was. Isn't that amazing? I learned for a year Chuppah and Kedushin so that I could be Masada Kedushin. And it wasn't for her, interestingly, that I learned. I learned actually from my son. Because remember, I have a son from Australia. He, he wanted to get married, and his wife-to-be called me and said, you know, she knew that I had Smitha. She doesn't really understand. She also was coming from a very, like, uh, non-religious home, a Jewish girl, but she didn't really know anything. And she knew that I had Smitha. So she says to me, can you marry us? Can you marry your son and me? And I thought, I don't know anything about that. But I sp And I spoke to Rabbi Bigler about it. He says, there's a lot of halachas. It's not so simple. You have to, you know, apprentice with somebody. He, like, really, like, tried to talk me out of it. And then, and then I was looking online, and this Lamendu, what's it called again? Lamdenu. Yep. Lamdenu, this organization in Crown Heights, 
they have classes like this because of the shluchim. Because the shluchim, in a certain way, were just like me. They don't know anything about marrying people and all the halachas. So uh, I, I learned for a year. And the only thing is, you know, you'll get a kick out of this. The only thing is, I could not read the Israeli documents to sign the documents. Because in Israel, she got married in Israel. You, there's like a you know a page of, of number ten font of, of a form that you have to fill out for the rabbinate. Interestingly, the the uh, certificate that I got was was recognized by the rabbinate in Israel, but I needed another rabbi to fill out the paperwork. <laughs> but it, it all happened. So that girl now is got married. That girl now has an amazing religious life. You know she's. Uh, like fully a very religious girl, very quite amazing. And the other girl, also, she's very from. She you know, like like it kind of amazes me. I wasn't sure what it was going to be. My son, on the other hand, is still like you know on the edge. He's. Uh, I notice he wants to go to shul. He has a son, my grandson. He takes the little boy to shul. It's a very interesting thing. He marries a girl, and they name the boy Harrison, right? Chaim Shammai, yes, but his, his English name is Harrison, and they call him Harry. So my son is doing the genealogy of his wife on one of these ancestry websites, and he sees that his wife is the 16th generation descendant of the Ari. Is that crazy? And they named the kid Harry, so I call him Ha-Ari. They didn't even know that when they named him that, so I thought that was very funny. <laughs> Let me think. What else can I tell them? Who's your son-in-law? The son-in-law. So, uh, so they get married on September 6th. A month later, October 7th. A week after that, or two weeks after that, he's in Aza. And he's a, a um, combat engineering soldier. So, but he's a Hezder boy, right? So the Hezder, he had finished his military component of Hezder. So, he's not, so there's a technical thing. He's not a reservist. He's not official army. He's no longer doing the military component of Hezder. So what is he? He's like really nothing. But he, he is a Dati Lumi. You know what that means? Like a modern, he's a, a religious Zionist. The religious Zionists are the ones, the greatest percentage of them, who are laying their lives down for the state of Israel. And he had to go to Aza. He just got married. I was like, can't you think of something else to do? Nope, I have to go to Aza. And he was there for a month. We didn't hear from him sometimes for 10 days or so at a time because they can't have phones in Aza. You know, the phone, when you hold the phone up at night, it clicks on, right? You ever notice that? That you just, even if it's dark and you hold the phone up, it knows your face. You have facial recognition on your phone? So as it flashes an infrared beam at your face that you can't see. But if a soldier has one of these on him, it's constantly sending out an infrared beacon. So if the enemy has an infrared camera, this thing is like flashing, boom, boom, boom. Here's somebody with a phone. That's why they cannot have phones. That's the main reason. Not, notwithstanding, they could, I guess, triangulate them and find them or something like that. But the phone is a, is a, a beacon. So we didn't hear from him for long periods of time. But now, thank God, he is out, and he's back in yeshiva, and he's learning again. But I think it was very, very important for him to go and, uh, and fight for Israel. His brothers, he comes from a family of five other brothers, and all of them are elite soldiers. They're all still fighting. He's the only one, actually, who's out. But he's also the youngest. Yeah, very beautiful. Are any of your siblings from your family, anyone? No. What are they? No, nobody is. My, my mother was just nifter about, uh, let's see, on um, January the 6th. So not too long ago. I haven't had a session yet. And um, my brother came for the Levaya. Ooh, the family was upset. You're burying her the next day? How can you do that? Nobody can come. They were very annoyed with me. But my brother flew overnight. He lives in Arizona. And he stayed with me for about four or five days. And he sat shiva with me. And he davened with me in the house. 
And at the, at the end, when he was leaving, he says, you know, I might do something like this when I get home. So somehow it really uh, it did touch him. It's a very beautiful thing. Very beautiful thing. Like, my mother had been sick for three years. So I have to say, very frankly, like, I knew she was going to pass. And she had been in such bad shape that in a strange way, it was a bracha for her to let go of her life and to move on to the next world. I really didn't feel like I, I cried at her death because of the, the grief of you know you losing your mother. But at the same time, there was another part of me that felt like it was the best thing for her. So, so I was able to, to see the Leviya was, was um, like so beautiful. So it wasn't like a, a tragic thing. It was a beautiful thing. Rabbi Vigler drove all the way up there and they, my, my whole chevra from Tina came up there. It was, it was really amazing. It was a snowstorm that day. Rabbi Vigler says to me, maybe you should make it a little bit later so that the, that the snow will stop. But, but uh, uh, whatever, the way it worked out, it was in the afternoon. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And right when they, right when they lowered the casket into the ground, the snow stopped, stopped falling. The sun came out. But the shoveling of the dirt into the hole, I don't know how many of you, you know, like I think when you're young, you may never even have seen such a thing. But there's something about that that is really very final. It's very touching. It's very like, like this is really the end when that box goes into the ground. And it was so sweet. Like I don't know whether you even noticed you were doing it, but Rabbi Vigler was like, mounding the dirt on top of my mother's coffin to make it like beautiful it was very sweet you know like it really it was very very touching and the and the shiva is it also like an amazing amazing ritual that we have what do you do you sit there and all your neighbors and your friends come into the house you don't have to feed them you don't have to entertain them you get to talk about your mother <laughs> you know most, most people i don't think would be so interested in anybody talking about their mother but it was a, it was very beautiful like one one group would leave the next group would come in the next group would leave the next group would come in and it was uh, it, i really in a weird way enjoyed the whole shiva thing I don't know. Yeah, do people usually say that? Usually, it's probably like they're not so happy that they're there. But, but for in my situation, I enjoyed it, and I was I felt like more and more I got to see that my mother was moving into her next, you know, stage or whatever of her existence. I don't I don't see death as being the end. I think that we are halak elokai, and so the eternality of Hashem is the same thing that we have deep inside of us, and we are also that same eternality. So I really wanted to get across to you guys about this whole concept of the, of the shlichus and going out on the psoyim, like this rabbi came to my farm. And it's because he came to my farm that this whole story got initiated. I was only turned off by Yiddishkeit. I had a terrible experience as a kid in Hebrew school. I had a, the, my experience in the yeshiva, it was like, you know, like confusing to me. Because when I sat down, I came, like you see, I, I knew nothing, less than nothing when I went there. And I went to the yeshiva, and they said, okay, you sit over here, and you're going to learn Gittin. I said, yeah, but, but I don't even know how to read Hebrew. Don't worry, don't worry, it'll all come to you. It didn't come to me. I would sit in, the, in Rabbi Goldstein's shirim and not even know what he was talking about for months. It was a very bad experience. So what I'm telling you is that for somebody like me, you need to start where the person is at. Don't start like and think, oh, they're going to rise up to your level. Because I am telling you, maybe one in a million would. But I think I'm a reasonably smart person. And I didn't. I just found the whole thing a complete like frustration and like wondering, like, am I stupid? Like, am I missing something? Am I like, like why would they do this? I think there are places that they would take a person and lift them up slowly. And you know where they lifted me up slowly? Rabbi Angle lifted me up slowly. They lifted me up slowly at the Kolel in Melbourne. Those rabbis, they held my hand. They took me slowly. Rabbi Vigler, Herschel Goldman. These people, they took me from where I was at, and they lifted me up and held me and understood my situation, and that is what really worked. 
So this idea of like, don't worry, you get it. That I don't think works. I don't know what your experience is like, but that's my experience. All right. No. Do we have a question? Sweet. Are you still a doctor? Yeah, I, I am a chiropractor and I specialize in curvature of the spine. Scoliosis it's called, like where people have a twisted spine. And, I, and I'll tell you, this will be interesting for Rabbi Vigler. I had the first, I get patients come to me from all over the world, but I never had anybody come from Australia until last week. <laughs> I, was so, I was so happy, like finally I got Australia. Because I have a map in my office where all the patients come from, and when they, right before they leave, they put a sticker on this map. So every, I have patients from Africa and Europe and the Middle East, and, and I never had anybody from Australia then. China, India, but never from, but now I have from Australia. So I was very happy about that. That was just this week. <laughs> I've written two books on the subject. It's, a, uh, it's an amazing thing that I did, and it's very, very satisfying. I think that's another, another thing for you guys, is that you have to find, <clears throat> There's very few things in life that really mean anything, in my estimation. Having children is very important. And finding a work that you really love and that you really feel is meaningful, very important. Like, look at this guy. Look at the work that he does. It's unbelievable. The satisfaction and the way he impacts other people's lives. Even in Teaneck, you know, they, we have a branch of my extended family in Teaneck. And the, we, I was just donating something to them today, actually, because there was a mother who was, uh, you know, Ra uh, Rabbi Simon sent me an email. He said, there's this mother, and she can't pay her rent. And then, then you know, like, this, like there's so many people who have deep need that, the, that these organizations are so powerful. So I'm telling all of you that I, I think learning Torah is very good. Don't get me wrong. But I think there's, my opinion, there's very few people that are going to learn full time for the rest of their lives. I think you need to find a work. Maybe that's their work. Maybe that's a work that's uh, meaningful to that person. I don't think it would work for me, obviously. It didn't. I couldn't do that full time. But I do learn. I, like Rabbi said, I got smicha. I'm actually, I did, uh, I, I got a certificate in uh, uh, Pesach. I did this Kup and Kedushin. I'm doing another smicha even right now. I'm in about 30% through uh, doing a smicha on uh, Shabbos through uh, an organization in Lakewood called Pirchei Shoshanim. Um, so I do believe in learning. But I also think having a work that really involves you and you love it and it gives you tremendous satisfaction is also a key to having a happy life. What's the other one besides the work? Children. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. Having kids is very important. I think I'm talking to the talking to the converted here already though. Having children, I think you understand that. Probably most of you would come from large families. No? Who's an only child? Nobody, right? <laughs> Good. What else? Who else has a question? Come on. Everything you ever wanted to know about somebody who came from the other side. Pardon? When did you become a doctor? Why? When? When? Oh. Um, 1982 graduated chiropractic school in 1982. <clears throat> I was originally going to be a plant scientist. And then a chiropractor cured me of a pain that I'd had my whole life. And I'd been to many, many different doctors. And everybody told me, there's nothing wrong with you. What are you you're imagining it. But I knew I had it. I had to get these terrible chest pains. And a one time I went to a chiropractor, not even for that, because I didn't make the connection between your back and your, and your chest pain. And the chiropractor found it, and he fixed it without me even telling him about it. And I was so like confused by that, like, how did you know? And he explained to me, and he taught me, and then I had that aha moment where the clouds parted, the ray of sun came down upon me, and I heard the voice say, you could do that. It's like, yeah. So I did. Never looked back. That's like you're learning. I'm like, when you're in yeshiva, I told you this, you'll be fine. Yeah. 
first thing that, like you said, okay, let me go through this title thing. Like, did it just happen like just like that? Like one morning, like, here we go? No. It goes back a long time, actually. When I was about eight years old, I had this, like, very, very deep, I don't know what, I don't even know what it was, to tell you the truth. But I had some, like, crazy experience when I was a little kid. I was eight years old. I remember I was at summer camp, and I was reading a comic book. And in the back of the comic book, it taught you how to meditate by repeating a word. I think it was like just saying Coca-Cola or something over and over. And I did, and I was, like, just doing it just because I was reading this comic book. And all of a sudden, I got blasted out of my body into, like, absolute blackness and I, I got so scared that I like freaked out and all of a sudden I'm back in my body. I took the comic book and I threw it in the garbage and, and I left the room I was in to find where the other kids were at camp. But from that day on I knew that this world wasn't the only world. I had like my own experience that this world, the world that we see the world that, w that our senses tell us is here, that we can listen to and touch and feel and taste, is not the only reality. And so I felt driven to understand what was that experience. And that's really what kept me going all those years and eventually took me to the Kolo because I thought, you know what? I'm not, I actually even had that experience when I was 18 and went to Yeshiva. I thought, I'm not Jewish by accident. I have access to this amazing Masora. I should, I should find out what it's about. But unfortunately, I had this very negative experience with the yeshiva where they didn't know how to, I don't know what you want to call it, lower themselves to my level or something? I don't know how you would say it. But it, whatever it was, it didn't work for me. And I, I rejected it until I had the next experience with my son wanting to go back to school and finding this new school. And I got involved with the community just because he was involved with the school. It was interesting. I, I really wasn't thinking I was going to get much out of it myself. I did it for him. Hashkacha yeah. practice, right? It took a long time to come back around. But that was the formative experience. Eight years old. Any? How did you end up in the Yeshiva Nazi There was like something like somebody pushed you there? When I was in university, I had a roommate, Ruvain Elston. And uh, he became a chassid, actually, of, uh, of um, uh, Rabbi Nachman, Breslov. But anyway, at that time, he was in that yeshiva. And I guess I must have stayed in touch with him. And I said to him, like, where are you? What's going on? He said, I'm in this yeshiva. Come. So I thought, you know what? I'll do it. I'll go. And I was there for four months, struggling my way through. I, I mean, it wasn't a totally negative experience. Don't get me wrong. I had some fun times there, too. We went down. I remember there was a break over, uh, I guess it must have been Cholomoid Sukkot, maybe? I don't remember a, a, a Sukkot there, so I don't know what it was. But it was some kind of a break from the yeshiva. We went down to Sharm el-Sheikh. That was when Israel owned the Sinai. So you could go all the way to the very, very bottom of the Sinai. And it was like, at that time now, there's like five-star hotels there. At that time, there was nothing. It was a fishing village, and there was nothing there. We camped out on the beaches. It was beautiful. So I definitely had some good experiences. But this friend of mine uh, was there. So I felt like I had like a place to land. You know, like I didn't, I didn't speak Hebrew. I didn't know anything. I remember getting on the bus from the airport and I said, I want to go to Har, I want to go to Mount Zion. And the bus driver is like, huh? Huh? Like Mount Zion. And some American lady comes over to the bus driver and says, Artzion. Oh, you know, like. <laughs> it was called Yeshiva Hafutzot, the Diaspora Yeshiva. You heard of it? Located where? Kever David. Yeah, right, right outside the Kever David and Hartzia. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> it was like a steady stream of pilgrims. Christian pilgrims coming through this building because the the so-called room of the Last Supper was there. Obviously, it wasn't really the room of the Last Supper because it was a Crusader castle that had been built in the 1600s or something, but, or maybe 1200s. But it definitely wasn't uh, the, the room of the Last Supper. But that's uh, that's what they called it. So there was this constant 
parade of people coming through there. But yeah, Kevin David was there, had access to the old city. It was really a, a beautiful spot. So I, I don't want to be totally negative about it. My father <coughs> came over to Israel on a UJ mission. And he went into the room with Rabbi Goldstein. And they called me in. And they said, your father and I decided you should go back to America and finish your education. So I felt like relieved on the one hand, grateful that my father had come and kind of bailed me out. And also, like, very, like, betrayed by Rabbi Goldstein. You know, like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, he had, the week before, he'd been talking about how you shouldn't go to college, you shouldn't do anything, you should just stay here and learn, become a rabbi. And now, all of a sudden, I, so I, to this day also, I don't know what happened there. Maybe my father gave him a donation or something. To talk to <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, yep, I got on my plane, got back to JFK, and had that realization, like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Who am I kidding? Who am I kidding? And also, I lived in Iowa. The chiropractic school I was going to was in Iowa. There was not even a Jewish community in Iowa where I was, anyway. I'm sure, like, uh, there is obviously a Jewish community in Iowa called Postville, but that wasn't anywhere near where I was. What else? Who else has a question? This is it. We're, we ran out of time. Ten o'clock. Past my bedtime. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I really appreciate this place. It's quite amazing for me to see it. I heard about it, but I've never been here before. So I really appreciate you uh, hosting me and letting me come here and see this place and see what's going on. And it looks like it's working. It looks like it's really working good. You guys look like you're learning seriously. And I listened to the questions that people brought. And you know, when I was listening to the questions that people brought to Rabbi Bigler tonight, I was thinking to myself, it's very real. There's not, like, nobody's pretending here. People are real. Like, he wants you to give the honest questions. And I thought his answers were, like, mind-boggling. I was really like, wow. I wish, I was sitting there thinking, like, I wish when I was your age, I could have come here and listened to Rabbi Bigler. It would have been a different life. But hey. I got to listen to him in uh, in Melbourne. <laughs> and tonight. And we want to thank Dr. Strauss for helping in the campaign. Yeah, my, my great pleasure. Uh, helping the Bachman Montero. And who is Dave? Hmm? And there who is Grace? Grace. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. take a selfie because my wife will never believe